which you receive, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And the Bible will be on our sermon. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity for all of us to come together to worship you and, and to receive your word. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see you. Turn around and find somebody to say hi to and just let them know that you are happy to see them this morning.
Joseph. See. You all sound amazing today. The King is alive and hallelujah. And my name is Beth Claxon, and I'm the Children's Ministry Director here at Burlington Baptist Church. And it's so good to see each and every one of you all today. If you're vis visiting with us for the very first time, we'd like to welcome you in and glad that you're here with us here at Burlington Baptist today. We'd love to connect with you, and the best way we can do that is through a connection card. So you can do that in several ways. You can scan the chair back there in front of you. If you're watching online, you can go online digitally and fill out an online connection card. Or you can just stop back at our welcome desk out in the foyer, and they'll be glad to help you. But we just want to know you a little bit better, get to know you, and let you know of some other opportunities here in the church that you might like to get involved in. So we hope that you do that. I hope you notice also as you came in this morning at the top of the stairs there in the foyer in the back, there is a table with baby bottles on that. And that is for CareNet. Now, CareNet is a nonprofit, and they work with individuals who may be dealing with an unexpected pregnancy, and for those even possibly that might be considering abortion. And they like to talk about um, saving the child and giving that child life. So if you'd like to help with that matter, like I said, they're a nonprofit, you can do so by taking one of those bottles and putting some change in it or some dollar bills in it or a check and bringing it back here at the church on February 19th. And it's just a way as we here in the community can support their, those efforts. So um, this Wednesday, we actually start back with a lot more of our activities. We've been already started back with our children and youth. But this Wednesday, we'll be starting back again with our um, Wednesday night dinners. We also have a new women's Bible study that will be starting back up, and that will be at 630. Um, they are going to be doing um, the church during the search, led by Beth Maynard, and that will be at 630. But if... Wednesdays aren't your time. We also have another women's Bible study that will be meeting on February 6th. That's Mondays at 1, led by Patty Westfall. And I believe they're doing a uh, series on heaven. So if one of those is of interest to women, we'd love to encourage you to be here. But on Wednesday nights, we have all kinds of things. We have things for men, women, um, a prayer meeting that's led for by Michael Buteau. And we would just love for you all to come out. I always say this church is buzzing on a Wednesday night. And for you that just come on Sunday, you need to come on a Wednesday night. It's a lot of fun, and we really enjoy um, praising and worship um, midweek with you guys. Um, also, um, if you notice, I'm holding a backpack. Back there by the um, baby bottles, beside that, are a few of these backpacks. This past Wednesday night, our children, we had a wonderful mission um, project that we did through Summer Lily helped us, and we made um, backpacks for the homeless. So um, they're nice to have in the car. There's like soap, toothpaste, that type of thing, and some other goodies, and uh, lip... Uh, chapstick and things in there. So it's just a nice to have in your car when you come upon someone to give them to somebody. So we have several extra. So if you'd like to grab one and put in your car, maybe add a few more things if you'd like, um, they're there for you to take. So we hope that you do so as well. Something else that I'd like for you to put on your calendar, and that is Sunday evening, February 19th, 6 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary. We'll be having a program, and it's, it is actually geared toward parents and grandparents, but I tell you, it's for anybody. It's for anybody with a child. Um, we are going to be talking about the talk that we don't like to talk about, uh, such as sex and puberty and things like that. Um, it'll be here in the sanctuary, and it'll be a really good time um, of learning. Our very own Greg Tanner will be leading that, and he is a licensed professional clinical counselor, um, but also he's a Christian, and it'll be so good to hear that from a Christian perspective. So like I said, it's for everyone because everybody knows a child, and if you're here in church and leading kids or anything, um, please also invite your family and friends. It's open to the community, and I think it's definitely a topic that we need to discuss and be aware of as Christians. So let's continue to worship this morning, and as we do so, I'll lead us in a word of prayer. So pray with me, please. Father God, we come to you and praise you, God, because you are very worthy of our praise and worship, God. God, we love you, and we thank you for all the many rich blessings that you bestow upon us, God, and for taking care of us each and every day. God, we do. We do thank you for your love. I thank you for the hope that you give us. And God, we especially thank you for your grace, because through grace we have forgiveness of your sins through your son, Jesus Christ. But God, even better, that grace gives us freedom from those sins. God, I just ask now that you come, come be a part of this service today as we praise and worship you. Just clear our minds, help us to concentrate and to 
Open our ears to hear you and to see you through the word today, God. Lord, we just ask that you be with Brother Andy this morning as he brings the message that you've laid upon his heart, God. And God, we give you all the glory and praise. And we pray these things in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us again as we continue to worship this morning.
sound awesome. Have a seat this morning. So uh, Courtney introduced this song a while. Well, she requested it. We had heard it quite a few times. And it's just a, it's just a really, really good song about uh, God's purpose for you, what he's got in store, um, that his blessings are sweet, and uh, our prayer life. So there's all sorts of things going on. And just like always, uh, if you catch on to the song, which you should, you guys could sing along with it.
Thank you, Brother Danny and team. Didn't they do a great job? Praise the Lord, man. Thank you, brother. Well, it's good to be back with you, Burlington Baptist Church. And uh, you may be a little mad at me. I'm one of those KBC guys, and we carried off your pastor. But, man, thank you uh, for, uh, for allowing him to head that way now. Um, he's, the Lord's going to use him in significant, well, already is, in significant ways. Um, in, in several hundred churches and pastors who just need a lot of encouragement right now. And so um, thank you uh, for that. And thank you for your partnership uh, through the cooperative program. Uh, last year I was privileged to go to the Southern Baptist Convention in Anaheim, California. Uh, newsflash, we've got challenges. That's not new. And if the Lord tarries, we'll have some more. Uh, but for me, the highlight uh, of our convention was when we uh, set apart 52 new international missionaries to go into the world to carry the gospel to people, some of whom, hey, man, they've never heard the name of Jesus. And you had a part in that. And it was, it was really cool how they did it because they had like a couple or individual on this side of the stage and they would step up and introduce themselves and talk about where they're going. Then the next couple or individual would step up on this side of the stage, introduce themselves, talk about where they're going. I say they did that, but about half of them needed to be shrouded behind screens on stage, and they couldn't give their real names, and they couldn't talk about the country where they're going to serve, because where they're going to serve, it's dangerous to be a Christian. But you know what? They've already decided that Jesus is worthy. They've died to themselves, and he's worthy, and so they're going as our missionaries to carry the gospel, and thank you all. You have a part. And every bit of that. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11 in just a moment. If you're familiar with this letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to some folks there in Asia Minor or modern Turkey, uh, you know that they were being persecuted because they named the name of Jesus. That was their crime, if you will. They loved Jesus and they weren't ashamed of that. And so uh, that produced some persecution and oppression by people that didn't want to hear about uh, Jesus. And so Peter writes to them to encourage them and to help them to know how to live uh, in a gospel, a highly gospel-resistant culture. That's where they were. And listen, it sounds a lot like where we are today, certainly heading that way. We live in a highly gospel-resistant culture. And so Peter is writing to these believers and saying, here's how to live in that kind of a culture. In chapter 2, verse 11, you can look at it later, but he, he calls us sojourners and exiles, or some translations would say uh, aliens and exiles. Uh, but really, it's, it's describing Christians, those believers, and you and I by extension, it's describing believers as those who are not yet home and are passing through. <laughs> we're not yet home, we're passing through. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes want this to be home. But this isn't home, brothers and sisters. One day, if you're a believer in Jesus, you've trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, how good that is, right, to trust in you, Jesus. One day, you and I will take our last breath of earthly air, and then the next one will be heavenly air in the presence of Jesus. <laughs> And then we'll be home. And then we'll be home. But right now, we're sojourners and exiles. We've been saved. If you know Christ, you've been saved, set apart, child of God, not guilty. Uh, you belong to Jesus, right? That's the truth. But there's coming a day when we'll be with him forever in his presence. And so we're in this middle ground right now as sojourners and exiles. And so in this passage, Peter's going to help us to know how to live in that kind of a culture. So, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Here's what the Word of God says. 
The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's word. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Father, indeed, we pray uh, that you would be glorified in our time together. Lord, it's you that we desperately need to hear from. So God, give us grace now to lean in and ears to hear what the Spirit will say to us through your word. And get glory for yourself, and may we be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Peter says, the end of all things is near. So how should we, as followers of Jesus, live? Now, you know, as Christians, that when we use phrases like the end of all things is near, meaning Jesus is about to return, uh, people will sometimes criticize us or even mock us. You, man, you Christians, you all have been saying that for 2,000 years, and it hasn't happened yet. But I love what um, Peter wrote in 2 Peter verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. He said this, With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, catch this, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I can't tell you all the reasons why the Lord tarries, but I know this, based on that scripture, it's out of the overflow of his mercy. God wants more people to know him, to experience his love and salvation, and to be with him forever. He waits because he's a merciful and a good God. I remember... Uh, hearing someone say, we should live our lives as if Christ is returning in the next five minutes, but we should plan our lives as if he isn't returning for a hundred years. Live our lives like he could come back in the next five minutes, because it could happen. Amen? Amen? We could be here, and then we'll be gone, because <laughs> Jesus came back. But it might not be for a hundred years. We don't know. And so it's okay to make plans for your life. If you're young, you know, and you want to go to college or career or whatever, go ahead, do that. Get married, do that. If you're like me and you're kind of not, I'm not retired, not, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting close, it's okay to think about retirement. It's okay to think about those things, but just remember, as you live your life, live it in such a way that if Jesus were to come back in the next five minutes, man, you've got nothing to be ashamed of because you're living all out for him. Man, if he gives you breath, keep going for it for Jesus' sake. And listen, you are not too old to serve Jesus, right? You may not be able to do all the things you used to do, but everybody go like that. If you got a pulse, you got a purpose, right? So keep serving King Jesus like he might return in the next five minutes. Let's use our sanctified imagination. Let's imagine that in the next five minutes, God forbid, but in the next five minutes, a natural disaster is going to hit and it's going to level your house to the ground. Man, I think about our brothers and sisters and friends in western Kentucky, the tornado last December, a year ago December, and then the floods uh, earlier this last year. Man, they, they experienced that for real, didn't they? And, and uh, I'm so thankful uh, for the disaster relief folks and others that went down there. Maybe some of you all, you made your way to one or both of those places and you served other people and you helped them to begin to recover. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for giving. Even if you didn't do that, by the way, uh, you had a part in it through disaster relief teams going down there and meeting needs and sharing Jesus. But if let's just imagine, though, that it's going to happen to you. Your house is going to get leveled. you got five minutes. All of a sudden, what's most important comes to the front of your mind, right? Like, what do I need to get out of that house? Now, I assume you'll take every living thing out of there, right? Well, maybe you'll leave some plants and the cat. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dog guy. I'm, just, I'm kidding. I just wanted to make sure I were still awake with me. But you're going you're gonna to think about things like important documents, maybe the keys to the car. I don't know, some cash. You're going to think about things that, man, I'm going to need to survive. All of a sudden, what's most important comes to the front of your mind. As we live in this highly gospel-resistant cult culture, as sojourners and exiles, we need to live in such a way that we are pursuing 
the living God and his priority for our lives at all times. Man, we need to travel light and with great purpose, great commission, purpose. And we need to choose not just good things, but God things, best things to live for in our lives. Man, things like getting the gospel to lost people. Anybody got any lost people in your lives? Man, if you don't, then you should just start praying right now. God, would you lead me to some lost people in my life? Because every Christian needs to be around lost people so we can tell them about Jesus. I, I think about my brother Pat. Uh, he's my only remaining brother. He lives up in Dearborn, Michigan, where I'm from. Lives there with my mom. Takes good care of her. He's about a year and a half older than me. But Pat doesn't know Jesus. Man, I love my brother. I've shared the gospel with him multiple times. And he'll tell me, especially the last several years, he's telling me, Andy, I'm close. He said, I pray. And I said, that's great, Pat. But I said, listen, man, the first prayer that God hears is, Lord, I'm repenting of my sin and I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart and life. We have those kind of conversations. And I pray for him daily. You got someone like that? And that's, that's what I'm talking about. I think that's what the Word of God is talking about. As sojourners and exiles, live for best things. For eternal things. Listen, the only thing that's going to travel from this life into the next is the Word of God and the souls of people. The souls of people will be somewhere forever, one of two places, heaven or hell. Let's invest in that. And so uh, Peter's going to help us to have an end time ethic as sojourners and exiles. And so uh, in verse 7, he says, Therefore, be alert and sober minded for prayer. So when the end of all things is near, Peter says, Be vigilant in prayer. Your strangers and your exiles. Man, this isn't home. If ever there was a time for Christians to pray, it's today. And Burlington Baptist, let me just say, if ever there was a time for you as the people of God to unite your hearts, hearts in prayer, it's now, right? While you're in this interim period. Now, you're not, you're not just sitting back and going, well, we're not going to do anything until we get a preacher, right? You are still the church. Uh, this church belongs to Jesus. Uh, that's always been true. It's always going to be true. So you're not going to sit back, but you are in this kind of unique interim period. And so, man, if ever there was a time to unite your hearts together in prayer, it's today. It's this day and the days that follow. Man, you're gonna, I think you're going to be making a decision about a search team, right? Those folks need your prayer, man. The Lord's going to give them a big job, isn't he? Uh, but he's a big God. He'll take care of them. But you need to pray for those people. You need to pray for your staff. You've got some amazing staff. But they're going to call, be called upon to carry some extra duty, aren't they, in these days? And so, man, keep praying for them. Lift them up. Lift up their families. I love um, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where uh, Peter and John are before the, that ruling council there in Jerusalem called the Sanhedrin. Uh, they've been hauled in there because uh, they committed the crime of telling people about Jesus. And that Sanhedrin didn't like it. And so in Acts 4.13, the Bible records these words. When they, that is the Sanhedrin, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Do you, do, do you see what made the difference there? It wasn't their education or their training. It was that they had been with Jesus. <laughs> you know, people can tell when we've been with Jesus. And I believe they can tell when we haven't been with Jesus. And that's what distinguished those early apostles, Peter and John. And I just want to say to you, man, some, some of you all may think, well, I can't be used by God. I don't have a seminary degree or college degree or high school or even high school, whatever. Can I just tell you, that's not the prerequisite. Here's what God's looking for. He's looking for fat people. Faithful, available, and teachable. <laughs> Faithful, available, and teachable. If that's you, you're good. <laughs> he can use you. He can use you. Man, it's amazing. I think about men of God uh, who maybe even didn't have an elementary uh, age or grade education, who were called to preach, who preached the word in power and led people to Jesus. Man, they're out there by the, by the thousands who have done that. It's not education and training. I'm not saying those are unimportant. I'm just saying that it's not a prerequisite to be used by God. Just spend time with Jesus. I, 
I thought about this. Your, your work for the Lord is determined by your walk with the Lord. Do you see that? Your work for the Lord is determined by your walk with the Lord and not the other way around. Some people can try to get by on personality and charisma and, and maybe some natural gifts, but the truth of the matter is that if you want to be used by Jesus, you're going to have to spend time with him and get into his presence in prayer. See, I don't, I don't believe prayer is just preparation for the work or the battle. I believe it is the work and the battle. I believe the battle is fought and won in prayer. Uh, we need to set aside time every day to be with the Lord. And then all throughout the day, we need to constantly be whispering prayers to the Lord. Lord, would you help me with this? Uh, sometimes I, I can neglect that. Is, is anybody else like that in, in your life where you're going through some problems and, and you want to try and handle it? Your first inclination, that's me anyway. I want to try and handle it. But God's teaching me. He, he's patient. I'm grateful for that. He's teaching me. It just goes a lot better if I'll stop and just whisper a prayer. Lord, I need your help in this moment. I'm not sure what to do. You say, if I lack wisdom, I can ask, and you'll give it generously. I'm asking. To pray prayers like that throughout the day. Now, I know uh, you may be like me as well when you think about prayer, because uh, some of you have heard folks talk about their prayer lives, and, man, that God's really answering their prayers, and, and good things happen, and praise God for people like that. How many of you all, if I use the phrase prayer warrior, have somebody that comes to mind for you. Anybody? I say prayer warrior, okay? Can, can I just share this with you? I believe every Christian can be a prayer warrior. Every Christian can be a prayer warrior. Dr. Don Whit Whitney, he's a seminary professor there at Southern. He really helped me with this. We had him at the KBC for some training several years ago now, and uh, he used an illustration that helped me to, to really understand the power of prayer and to stay in the presence of God. He said, imagine like you've come in from a cold Kentucky day, right? It's not hard to imagine in these days, but you've come in and it's like you're chilled to the bone kind of day. You come into the house and you're shivering, right? That kind of cold. And you walk over and you notice there's a fire roaring here in the fireplace. And you walk up to it, maybe even stick your hands, but you just kind of pass on by and go on out the house again. And you say to yourself, Man, I'm still cold. That fire's not as advertised. I guess, I guess fire works for some people, but it doesn't work for me. Well, what was the problem? You didn't spend enough time in front of the fire to be warmed by it. So how much time should we spend in prayer with the Lord? I can't tell you a minute count, but I can tell you this. Stay long enough until your heart is warm in the presence of God, until your affections are engaged by the Spirit of God. That might mean you need to get up a little bit earlier and spend a little bit longer in the presence of God. I think there ought to be some times when we have our personal quiet time with Jesus that we shed some tears, that we cry over our own sin and repentance and faith. We cry, out, we cry aloud for lost people like I described earlier. I think we ought to cry at times in our prayer life. I think there ought to be times where we're just like super ecstatic, like Peter, man, praise God. You get all the glory, God. Thank you for meeting with me, God. I think we ought to have moments like that. But even if you don't have those, he's still, hear he's still hearing you. He's still listening. Stay in his presence long enough for your affections, for your heart to be warmed by his presence. You know, when you and I pray, we're declaring some really important things. Number one, we're declaring, Lord, I can't do this without you. I can't. I can't live this Christian life without you. I am desperately in need of you and your presence and your power in my life. And so I seek you in prayer. We declare our dependence on God. We're also saying, Lord, I believe when I pray that a loving he Heavenly Father who cares for me is listening on the other end. I believe that. Do you believe that this morning? I believe that if you're a child of God, unless your prayers are, cindered by, are, are hindered by sin, that's a new word, cindered, if they're, if they're hindered by sin, uh, then, then, then your prayer is simply to confess your sin and repent of it and know that a loving Father forgives you, right? But other than that, when you pray and seek the face of God, He hears every word. 
Now, his answer might be yes, his answer might be no, or his answer might be wait. The timing isn't right. But you can count on it. A loving Heavenly Father hears his children when they pray. And then this, a final thought. When we pray, we need to pray with open hands. Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. I don't know about you, but I've tried to live my life a lot getting my own will done, and it always ends poorly. (laughs) It's always a train wreck. But when we pray, God, I want your will to be done, even though it may lead us into some painful places sometimes. Someone said that we experience challenge and hardship and pain as Christians when we get outside the will of God, and that's true. But sometimes we experience pain and hardship and struggle precisely because we're in the middle of the will of God. Sometimes the will of God will lead us to some painful places. But even then, we can trust that our God knows what he's doing. He's got you in the hollow of his hand, and he will never turn you loose. If you're his, you're his forever. I believe in once saved, always saved. I think a better way to say it, though, is if saved, always saved. I believe that, that everyone Jesus calls to be his, he keeps, every one of them. And so, Lord, I pray your will would be done with all these things that I have laid here before your throne. So when the end of all things is near, stay vigilant in prayer. And then this, when the end of all things is near, be warm and welcoming. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without complaining. You know, church is family. Would you agree with that? Church is family. In fact, I talk to people and they say, my church family is the best family I've ever had because I had a dysfunctional family and they weren't much of a family. I'm so grateful for my church family. Aren't you grateful for your church family? The Bible calls us to be hospitable to one another without complaining. And remember this about family, unless yours is different from mine. Family is messy. I've been married to Lisa. It'll be 34 years, July 1st. We've got three sons. Two of them are married, and one's going to be married in June. No grandbabies yet. I'm going, what are we doing here? I'm grateful for my family, but I remember when they were young and we'd pull up to church and we just had World War III in the car. And we get out and people say, how you doing? Oh, we're fine. We're good. Had to repent of that sin. Fa- family's messy, right? But it's worth it, isn't it? It's worth it to hang in there with your family. You need them. And one of the ways that we show care for our family members is to be hospitable towards them, even if they don't return that hospitality. And to do it without complaining. Man, how warm and welcoming is our Father to us, our Heavenly Father, right? And so He's calling us to be that towards each other. And I would say this is especially true when it comes to the outsider. The outsider. You know, think about somebody who's moved to this community because of a job or some other reason. And they might even be a strong believer, but they're trying to find a church home. And if you've ever done that, that's hard. That can be some hard work right there. And so they they come into the life of a Burlington Baptist, and the people of God are warm and welcoming. You think that makes a difference? Yeah, it does. In fact, listen, they've studied this. Uh, They've studied this. They have found out that first-time guests are going to decide whether they're going to come back to a church or not within the first 10 minutes of pulling onto the church parking lot. Ten minutes. So long before they hear a message preached or maybe even a song sung, they've already made that decision. So guess what is most important? The hospitality of the people of God. You see that? It's just that important. I'm a member at Simpsonville Baptist Church in Shelby County. Uh, I told my pastor when I joined I'm going to be a terrible church member because I'm going to be gone a lot. Uh, But my wife, she goes there, represents us, and I stay in contact with him. Uh, but when I am there, I try, to, I try to practice what I'm preaching. I try to greet people, like even in the parking lot, maybe especially in the parking lot. Hey, how you doing? I'm Andy. And they'll say, I, I know, this is the fifth time we've met. I've been a member here 10 years. Man, I would rather look like an idiot in that moment than to let someone go ungreeted. You see what I'm saying? So listen. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I know you've got a first impressions team, and, and by all accounts, they're doing an amazing job. 
But can I just say to each one of you all, can you just, can you just assume that you are deputized into the greeting ministry of this church? And so, man, if you, if you, have, you have your little row there, right, your little chairs, right? Uh, those belong to Jesus too, amen? <laughs> but you, you got your place. So if someone new sits anywhere around you, you go, I got them. And you introduce yourself, and you make them feel welcome in this place. Maybe take them out to lunch if you can, but be a friend to them. It may make an eternal difference because think about the outsider who's lost, who, who maybe is experiencing complete hopelessness in their life. Everything's jacked up, their marriage, their work, everything. And they have this thought, you know, I've, I've met some Christians in my day, and they say that they've got a relationship with the Lord, and I saw some joy in their lives. I think I'll go try church out. The moment they start thinking like that, guess who works against them? The enemy of God. He does, doesn't he? You don't want to go there. Man, go, you can go on another Sunday. Or, man, they're all a bunch of hypocrites. You don't want to go there. But they come anyway. And they pull onto that parking lot. Do you see the difference that Christian hospitality makes in that person's life? I think we should view the hospitality ministries of our churches as part of our evangelism ministry. Because it, it is. It is. It could make an eternal difference in someone's life. Be warm and welcoming. So when the end of all things is near, pray vigilantly and be warm and welcoming. And then this, when the end of all things is near, serve others. Verse 10, just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's word. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides. See, the moment a person is saved, guess what? The Holy Spirit of God takes up residency in their life and heart. Do you agree with that? Amen? The Holy Spirit, the moment they're saved, He comes and lives in their heart. You become God's address. And the Holy Spirit gives you at least one spiritual gift. I believe He gives most Christians more than one, but you have at least one spiritual gift, a gift from God that He expects you to use in service to Him in and through your local church, in and through this church. God has gifted you in that way. Now, some people, their giftedness has them out in front. They're more leadership kind of gifted people. But then there are those who are more behind the scenes, right? And maybe very few people, if any, know what they're doing for the Lord. But guess what? Jesus knows. Jesus sees. Every single job is important. Every single one. And I can tell you this, even though I, I don't know much about this church, I know some things about this church. I love coming to be a part of this church. But I can tell you the need for people to serve is great here. Because I, I know Baptist churches. It's great. And it's all hands on deck. So I, know, I noticed some, some Bengals fans around here <laughs> this morning. Do they, they got a little game going on here? I'm a Lions fan. You can feel my pain, right? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. We need to talk later. So when you watch that game this afternoon, here's, here's, a, here's an illustration of the church, of a lot of churches in the United States today. When you watch that game, you're going to see 22 men on the field who are in desperate need of some rest. And thousands of people in the stands who are in desperate need of some exercise. That's what you're going to see here. And that's the way a lot of our churches are today, brothers and sisters. There's a handful of people that are doing almost all the work. They're going for it as hard as they can for Jesus. And they're tired and worn out. And there's a bunch of people sitting back and going... You know, I kind of enjoyed church today. I might bless you with my presence next Sunday. Now listen, we're glad you're here, amen. But if this is your church, you have a place to serve. There's a job for you. And here's the cool part of that. If every Christian does what they have been spiritually gifted to do, then not one person is overwhelmed by the work. Everybody's doing their part. And everybody's getting joy in serving King Jesus, and they're not overwhelmed by it. 
And here's, here's what Peter says when he thinks about people serving the church with their giftedness. He goes on to finish in verse 11. So that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter gets super excited thinking about believers serving other people in the name of Jesus. God knows. He sees it. It matters. Use your gift to serve the Lord. You'll be eternally blessed for it. And then here's one final thought. When the end of all things is near, stay vigilant in prayer, be warm and welcoming, serve others. But then this thing, when the end of all things is near, keep your love at full strength. Verse 8, above all, above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sin. Love is the highest Christian virtue, isn't it? It's indispensable. Let me ask a question. Do you love your church family? I mean, look around, seriously. Do you love these people in this room? You may think, well, I, I do. I'm, I don't know if I like some of them, but I, I, I love all my brothers and sisters. I, I hope that's true for you because love is the highest Christian virtue. And we need to remind ourselves that when we love other people with the love of Jesus, it's costly. Sometimes people won't return that love. And sometimes they might even hurt us. In fact, mark it down. If you seek to love people with the love of Jesus, they're sometimes gonna, they're going to hurt you. Keep loving anyway, because he's worthy. He's worthy. Some people love with strings attached. I'll love you if. I'll love you when. But Christians, man, we need to keep the constant flow of love going in our lives towards one another. In fact, Jesus said that love marks the Christian's life. He said this, by, uh, if you love one another, by this will all men know that what? You are my disciples. I think Christians loving each other is one of the most powerful witnesses to a lost world that Jesus is real and the gospel saves. That when you love each other, how is that? Well, think about that same world that we talked about earlier with a lost person. It's, it's, it's so impersonal. It's so unkind. It's so mean at times. And people look at Christians loving each other well, and they go, what's different about those people? Do you see that? It's a powerful testimony to the truth of the gospel. You know, Paul wrote about the end times as well. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit gave Paul these words. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I don't know about you, but that sounds a, a little bit like today to me in the world that we live in. And when you and I love each other well, a lost world takes note of that because they don't have it. That word, maintain constant love, your translation might use the word love each other deeply or earnestly or fervently. It's a picture of an athlete straining to win the race. And Peter is saying, love each other like that. With that kind of love. Now, he, he says here that love covers a multitude of sins, and we just want to be clear that our acts of love can't earn forgiveness for another person. Only by trusting in Jesus can a person be forgiven of their sins and declared not guilty and made a child of God. But listen, when believers love each other well, which includes things like forgiving each other when they hurt one another, which includes things like overlooking past hurts and building each other up, especially those who have fallen. When you love each other like that, it's difficult for sin and resentment to flourish in a community of believers loving each other like that. That's what it means to cover a multitude of sin. Because the truth of the matter is only Jesus 
can wash our sin away. And nobody loved like Jesus loved. Nobody. Let's remind ourselves that Jesus, the Son of God, stepped out of heaven and became one of us. Became a man. Fully God, fully man. Became human. And he lived a perfect, sinless life. The only one of us, the only one of us who ever did. And he showed us the way because he is the way. And he taught us the truth because he is the truth. And he provides for us life because he is the life. See, Jesus, the Son of God, the, the only one of us that never sinned, didn't deserve to die, willingly allowed himself pinned to a cross. And on that cross, for the first time in all of eternity, the Son of God experienced sin. Not his own, but yours and mine. The sins of everybody who ever lived, is living, or ever will live were put on Jesus in that moment. See, God is a righteous and a holy God, and he must punish sin or he's not righteous and holy. And so rather than pouring out his wrath on us, what we deserved, Jesus willingly got in between the wrath of God and took it for us. And on that cross, he died, and he was buried, but then he rose to new life. And when Jesus walked out of that grave, he proved that he is who he said he is. He's the Lord. And he proved that he can do what he said he can do. Jesus and Jesus alone can forgive our sins and put us in right relationship with his Father, declaring us not guilty anymore, a brand new creation in Christ, child of God. Only Jesus can do that. You can't get there on your own. Our sin prevents it. We need a Savior. Jesus is the only Savior. And if you're here uh, this morning or you're watching online and you've never trusted in Christ, Man, I got good news for you. You came here. Maybe you thought you came here to get grandma or grandpa or mom or dad or somebody off your back. But I can tell you this. You came here because God wanted you to be here. And he's offering you the free gift of salvation. And it comes gift wrapped in the person of the Lord Jesus. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you can receive eternal life. It comes gift wrapped in the person of Jesus. I'm going to pray in a minute, and you can cry out to Jesus. It's not, there's no magic words. You can just cry out to him and, and, and say something like this to God. Father, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. And I'm turning from my sin, and I'm inviting Jesus to come into my heart and life and save me. You pray. It doesn't matter. The words really it doesn't. It's your heart. Are you ready for him to take 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 over the throne of your heart? You've been trying to be your own God, and 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 maybe this morning for the first time you've recognized I can't handle the weight of this. I can't do it. I need a savior. So you cry out to Jesus and ask him to take his rightful place on the throne of your heart, and he will. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, it says in Romans ten thirteen. God makes a promise. If you cry out in sincerity and faith and repentance, he'll save you. And maybe you're here, you're a believer, and one of these end-time ethics has kind of landed on your heart, and you realize, I, I hadn't really been seeking the face of God and walking with Jesus like I, I need to, and I need to, I need to do better. And, and, and just ask God for grace. God, give me grace to to desire to be in your presence more. I need you. Or maybe you've struggled in the area of hospitality and God's calling you, man, it's time to be warm and welcoming to each other and to everybody else you meet along the way. Or maybe God's saying, hey, it's time to find your place of service here. Find one of the staff. They'll hook you up. They'll show you. They'll walk with you. They'll, they'll help you discern your giftedness and, and get you plugged in. And then for everybody here, man, we, we all need to step up our love game, don't we? We need to love each other better. And we need God's help. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray in just a minute. And as the Lord's led you this morning, you, you just simply obey him. Man, there's blessing for 
obedience. And I just want to say that when we stand and we have that invitation, if I, if I can be of help to you, I'll be down front. I'd be honored to pray with you, talk with you, whatever you need. But I want to invite you, Burlington Baptist, man, the altar's open. If ever there was a time when the church needed to pray, it's now. And maybe a whole bunch of y'all just need to come to the altar and just lift up your church in this season. Listen, God already has a man for you. He, he knows who he's going to send here, but it will be in his timing. It will be in his time. So maybe you need to come to the altar, pray for that search team, pray for, for God to be glorified in this interim time. Pray that, pray that the very best days of ministry and serving King Jesus in Burlington Baptist Church would happen during this interim time. I don't know what God's going to lead you to do, but I want to invite you, if you're able, to come to the altar and cry out to God. Father, thank you so much for meeting here with us. We're so humbled and thankful. Lord, that you would give us a second of your attention is amazing, but yet you have lavished your love on us in Christ. And Lord, I pray for that lost one that's here in the room or watching. I pray that this would be the very moment that if we could hear with spiritual ears, we'd hear chains falling off as they receive Christ and are gloriously saved. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, would you bless them that indeed, Father, the very best days of this church would be in front of it and not behind it. Lord, get glory for yourself in this holy vertical moment of invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand if you're able? Please stand.
everybody have a seat for a second. Got some exciting news today. Just wanted to share it with you. Riley, why don't you come up and introduce our friend today? Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Riley. I want to introduce you to my friend Gus today. Uh, he's been coming for a few months now, and uh, Gus today wants to join the church. So we all join and welcome you, Gus. With you. Gus, you want to say anything? Am I? Can you guys hear me? You know, sometimes I got fed up with a microphone. I don't know. Maybe the microphone don't like me. Sometimes people ask, say, oh, I can't hear you. But however, I bless God to be in your midst. I've been part of the Baptist from Liberia. I accepted Christ uh, March the 1st, 1998. Uh, my generation being part of the chocolate background, the crack, the chocolate background, my entire generation, I'm the only person that broke away from the chocolate church, which is a long story. But I bless God also for the old folks that are here, and I'm happy to be among you all the old folks. I don't know my person here. I don't know what to say, but I tell God, thank you for your presence and life. Amen. And I'm happy to be part of you. And my desire I've been, since I've been in Florence, I've been in the U.S. almost 23 years, being affiliated with other churches, but it didn't really bear with me with my background, the Baptist background. So when I moved over here and I've been in such, I was fortunate driving by and I saw the car. So, okay, <laughs> now I'm going to make it here. So, yeah, I'm out today. Amen. Amen. Thank, you so much. Thank you, Gus, and we're excited to have you a part of our fellowship. Mr. Ken, you go ahead and have a seat right there, and then at the end of the service, I'm going to ask that Gus just come back up, stand up here. You guys come forward and just welcome him into the fellowship. Ken's going to share a little bit with us today. Good morning, everybody. I'll, I'll make it quick. I know, uh, I know everybody's anxious to get out of here. I'd like to thank Brother Andy for leading us today. Good sermon. We appreciate that. And... Uh, and I can also tell you that I will be eating lunch guilt-free today because I am fat. So thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I'm up here today to share with you, there, the, we have had the Dollar Club now for 10 years. And um, 10 years is a long run with the Dollar Club. And I know there's probably a lot of you here that, that don't remember when it started or how it works or why it works. So we just want to give you a really quick overview of the Dollar Club. The Dollar Club is, is, is a mission, and, and you know we're a mission-minded church. This, this isn't going to Western Kentucky or Eastern Kentucky. This is something we do right here in our own backyard. And there are people that are struggling, people that are hurting. And what you all don't see every week when you come in and put a dollar in that box out there, the, the boxes that Danny talks about every single week, is you don't see that single mom who's just lost her job that we're able to give her $1,000 to pay her mortgage. And what you don't see is that father that's drug addicted and his family's hungry. What you don't see is the person that got cancer and can't work or the house fire that, that took everything from a family that you all have been so instrumental in helping these people. And I, I wanted you to know about it. I wanted you all to hear about it. I wish you could see it every single month like I get to see it every single month because it's amazing. It, it just, it's just, it's an unbelievable ministry. So what I wanted to share with you all is you look at this up here in that 10 years, every time that you all put a dollar in that box, you all have gone out there over 188,000 times and put a dollar in that box. And that money, yeah, yeah, go, absolutely, praise God. So... We just wanted to take a minute to just let you all know where that money's going and what we're doing with that money. That money also, uh, it, it supports our benevolence team. So if there's somebody that, that needs money instantly, our benevolence team gets 25% of that. But every dollar that you all have given is gone. We give it all away. We give it all away. So I just wanted to share that with you, let you all know what the Dollar Club's all about and what it's doing because there's a lot of people that haven't been here 10 years. And, and you just hear, put a dollar in that box. But that's what that dollar's going for. And we thank you for that. So with that, I guess, we're going to pray. Dollar boxes are out there. And <laughs> All right, you guys, let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for Brother Andy, and we thank you for the sermon that we've heard. We thank you for Gus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for just all the blessings that you give us. Lord, sometimes we, uh, we, just, we don't see the blessings and everything, but we know that they're there. Lord, we thank you for your timing, and we thank you for your son. Watch over us as we leave here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 